It is charisma, or rather his aura, had two elements, as we saw earlier. It's on the one hand wanting to be close to people or trying to come across as being close to the people, so being an ordinary bloke, someone that people can relate to, and at the same time being a superior saviour, the country's redeemer. And you need to have both of these things because if you're just the country's redeemer and not an ordinary person, uh, not someone that people can feel close to, then, as I say, they can't relate to you. But if you're just an ordinary person, you obviously can't be the country's saviour. So you have to have, philosophers would say, a dialectic, a constant back and forth between ordinary bloke on the one hand is relatability, superior leader is saviour on the other hand. You need to have these two things. And this is precisely the kind of thing that Hitler always uh, tried to project and uh, sadly successfully did project. Let's first of all look at what is probably the most famous Nazi propaganda film, which is Triumph des Willens, Triumph of the Will, uh, which was directed by uh, Leni Riefenstahl and came out in 1935. Ostensibly, this is a kind of documentary on the Reichsparteitag, the Reich Party Conference of 1934, but it is really a film to oratify the Führer, to give people the feeling that Hitler is exactly these two things. He's a person you can relate to, but also a superior saviour. If you want to watch this film, it's a very long film. Uh, it's seen as one of the great, I guess in inverted commas, right? it's a Nazi film, but one of the uh, best made um, propaganda, political propaganda films ever. The di director, Leni Riefenstahl, it's interesting, by the way, that this was a woman, because the Nazi's propaganda person was, of course, propaganda minister Josef Goebbels. He wanted to make the film. Uh, and complained to Hitler, why am I not doing the film? Have I not proven my worth to you as a propaganda person and so on? But Hitler wanted Leni Riefenstahl. Very interesting in a, in a dictatorship which is so masculine and so focused on sort of uh, giving off this kind of macho uh, image. What's also interesting is that uh, Riefenstahl has been very influential on, uh, on other directors and politicians as well. So Roger Ailes, for example, who was the founder uh, and longtime chairman of the right-wing news channel Fox News, um, he died a few years ago. Uh, he was very in, uh, influenced by uh, Leni Riefenstahl. Uh, Steve Bannon, the political strategist uh, of Donald Trump, he was also a great admirer of uh, Leni Riefenstahl. You can watch the film. This is one of the uh, few Nazi propaganda films that is available uh, both on DVD and, and, and on the internet. Um, I would obviously recommend that you, watch, that you watch the entire film, but it's really the first 10 minutes that are central. There we see, first of all, Hitler flying into this, uh, the city of Nuremberg. So he doesn't arrive by car. He doesn't walk through the city gates or something like that. He arrives by plane. Now, why is this important? It's important, first of all, because as we know, power resides at the top, right? We know this from organigrams, from leak tables and so on. At the top, that's where the power is, and that's where Hitler comes from. And second, God is, of course, in heaven, uh, whereas we, his followers, the faithful, are down on earth. So this is a very deliberate attempt to portray Hitler as a kind of god, as a kind of messiah's figure. And in fact, the plane flying into Nuremberg is filmed in such a way that it casts a shadow on the ground, a shadow in the form of a cross or a crucifix. Again, highlighting this sort of religious uh, dimension about Hitler. And then there's a third aspect to this as well, which is that uh, this is the 1930s, so flying was still a relatively unusual form of transport. It was very modern. And this is one of the things that the Nazis, again, sadly, were really, really good at combining old things, so you have the medieval pageantry and so on, with modernity, giving people on the one hand the impression this is a movement, a way of thinking, an ideology with great German or quote-unquote Germanic tradition, 
But on the other hand, this is also a really modern movement that will push us forward. Uh, interestingly, Hitler didn't like flying. Uh, he, he was always, um, if not sick, but he really disliked flying, had a fear of flying. Uh, but he realized this is important for my, uh, for my public persona, so he flies into Nuremberg. Then the plane lands, and Hitler is driven to his hotel in a car, and then halfway through, the car stops, giving a woman with a child on her arm, symbolizing, obviously, the present and the future of Germany, giving a woman with a child on her arm the opportunity to give some flowers, a bouquet of flowers to the Fuhrer. I don't think it's frivolous to say that what would have happened today that is that Hitler would have stopped and his followers, you know, he would have allowed his followers to take some selfies with him, to say, I'm an ordinary bloke, I'm, I'm basically like you. Highlighting the personal bond between the leader and his followers. It's not only the woman who gives Hitler the flowers. If you have that, uh, uh, that shot, you also see a number of individual faces, rapturous faces. So this is not just an anonymous mass. This is people, you see their faces, you see Hitler's face, and there is this personal connection. Hitler speaks for us. Hitler is like us. Hitler is relatable. Hitler is uh, accessible. But then at the same time, we have the other pole of the oratic relation that I already talked about earlier, right? When Hitler comes down, uh, flies into Nuremberg, he's a kind of demigod. And when he's in the car, he has his, his sort of outstretched right hand, as we, as we know, right? And his, his hand seems to sort of radiate a kind of supernatural glow. Um, Lene, Lene Riefenstahl makes sure that the camera um, records that in that, that particular uh, way. In addition, there's kind of a halo above Hitler's head, again, giving him this sort of religious uh, status. So if you look at the first 10 minutes of that film, you can see how very consciously Hitler and Riefenstahl stage this combination of proximity and distance, of relatability and sort of savior-like nature of Hitler. Hitler did the same thing with uh, photography, with photographs of him, in order to preserve the consistency of his image. He only ever worked with one photographer, only one photographer had constant access to Hitler. This was someone called Heinrich Hoffmann. And Heinrich Hoffmann and Hitler together, much more so actually than propaganda minister Josef Goebbels, were responsible for creating this charismatic or erratic persona of Hitler. And again, doing it in the same way. On the one hand, Hitler, ordinary bloke, man of the people. So Hitler would be photographed reading a newspaper. Um, Hitler would be photographed uh, with, with his dog. Hitler would be photographed shaking the hands of ordinary people, of workers. And then there would be a caption uh, saying, uh, he is the son of his people, something like that, right? There would be photographs of Hitler's mother. And then uh, there would be a caption saying, you know, this photograph of Hitler's mother is one of Hitler's most treasured possessions. There would be a photograph maybe of Hitler's father uh, that said, you know, Hitler always respected his father. Now, it's true that Hitler loved his mother, but he, did re he, he really didn't love his father. He uh, didn't respect his father either, kind of hated his father. But this was the image that Hitler uh, projected. On the one hand, again, ordinary bloke with parents and liked by the workers and all the rest of it. But at the same time, there would be photographs of Hitler as a great military leader entering France, for example, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. The Nazis, by the way, had a special name for Hitler, after the initial uh, Blitzkrieg, they came up with the acronym GRÖFATS, uh, which stands for the größte Feldherr aller Zeiten, the greatest military leader of all time. Right, so Hitler was going to be this great architect, he was photographed as being the great architect, the great guarantor of peace, and then after Germany had started the Second World War, Hitler became the great military leader, the greatest military leader of all time. So in Hitler photography too, just like in the film Triumph of the Will, you have this combination, this constant back and forth between someone who is like all of us, but unlike any of us. Another way in which Hitler tried to project the image of an ordinary bloke was in his clothes. Hitler always deliberately dressed down to the point of shabbiness. 
His servants would comment on this and say, you know, why don't you wear some, cautiously suggested fewer that maybe he should dress up a little bit. But Hitler very deliberately did not do this. He wanted to come across as a man of the people. The only medal that Hitler ever wore was the Iron Cross that he had earned during the First World War. And the Iron Cross was the only military award you could get regardless of rank. So again, this is this sort of, attempted to say meritocratic or sort of almost uh, classless idea that Hitler tried, uh, tried to project. Other Nazis, like Commander-in-Chief of the German Air Force, Hermann Göring, had rows of medals. Göring even had uh, special uniforms made, made for him, uniforms which he had designed him, him, himself. Hitler would have none of that. He wanted to come across as this ordinary bloke. But it's not that's a dress uh, that is important about Hitler. It's also what we tend to think of as his signature feature, which is his quote-unquote silly moustache. It's very easy nowadays to do a little drawing, and if you do the Hitler moustache, everyone immediately knows, oh, you know, because of the moustache, this is Adolf Hitler. Now, populists all across the world tend to have, if, I mean, today, tend to have very striking hair. Donald Trump has got his golden hair. Uh, Boris Johnson has got this sort of very striking, disheveled looking haircut. Uh, the Dutch populist uh, Geert Wilders has got a very striking uh, hairdo uh, as well. And when we think of Hitler, we think, oh, Hitler probably also wanted to look special. And that's why he went for uh, this, this particular moustache, cre creating a specific Hitler look. Now, that's actually not true. What Hitler did was that he opted for a moustache, which was quite common at the time. In order to um, understand this a bit better and understand the reason why Hitler chose this particular moustache, you've got to have a very short look at the history of facial hair. So in the late 19th century, many men would have these big, bushy, patriarchal uh, beards. I'm sure you've seen photographs of that. But they were slowly going out of fashion. What was gaining more and more ground was the clean-shaven look, which was coming from America. Now, this placed particular pressure on the German emperor, Wilhelm II, because Wilhelm II fancied himself a great military leader and a great statesman. In reality, he really wasn't that. He was at the same time uh, impatient and impetuous, but then also couldn't make up his, very often couldn't make up his mind. He actually had a, um, uh, one of his arms wasn't working properly. Uh, so he, in, in the parlance of the time, this, he, he was seen as you know, a, a cripple. But again, he had this great vision of himself as a great military leader, a great statesman. Wilhelm II then was an incredibly ambitious man. So he needed a, a facial appearance to go, to, to go with that ambition, to match that ambition. So how is he going to look? The big, bushy, patriarchal beards were going out of fashion, so he couldn't do that. But the clean-shaven look was too American, so he couldn't do that either, as, or he felt, he felt he couldn't do that either as German emperor. So it had to be a kind of moustache. But what kind of moustache? The court hairdresser, a kind, uh, someone called Francois Habi, came up with the perfect solution, which was a kind of upward-pointing handlebar, a sort of an erect, a virile moustache looking like this. This was then imitated by many men at the time, including um, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, who sported that particular moustache all his life. Fast forward to 1918, Germany has just lo lost the war, and 1918, 1919, 1920, Hitler wants to become a uh, a successful politician, a populist politician. So what uh, facial appearance is he going to choose? Again, for him to the big bushy beard is a thing of the past. Clean shaven look to American, can't do that. But the, what was called the Kaiser Bad, the Wilhelm II uh, moustache with the upturned extremities. Well, Wilhelm II, Germany had just lost 
the First World War. Paul von Hindenburg, been in charge of the First World War for Germany, or one of the people anyway, uh, he had that moustache as well. So Hitler th thought, this is a thing of the past as well. Hitler decided to opt for what in the English-speaking world was known, was already known, as the toothbrush moustache. So this wasn't a new look. Um, Charlie Chaplin uh, sported a toothbrush uh, already in 1914. Hitler himself in the First World War had a sort of a very fairly long, long moustache. Uh, but he wanted to look more modern. And what was modern at the time, and this was a style again that many men already had, was the, was the toothbrush uh, moustache. So Hitler, in order to come across as man of the people, he didn't create the new, a new Hitler look that another people followed. He actually followed the example of other ordinary men, uh, especially military men, who already had the toothbrush moustache. And that was then the facial appearance that Hitler went for.